Hello, hello. Good to see everyone. Welcome to Modular Summit 2023. <clears throat> About a year ago at Modular Summit 2022, we hosted an event in Amsterdam where we tried to tackle a problem that has plagued us in the blockchain space for over a decade, which is this problem that monolithic blockchains don't scale, and we've, end up in a, we've ended up in a constant, endless cycle of new monolithic layer ones every single cycle that fizzle out and don't live up to their promises. So to recap, I'm gonna explain what modular blockchains are and what their benefits are. Then I'm gonna talk into a little bit about the progress of the, of the modular stack today, some open problems and what the destination is that we should all be aiming for. So, you know, when the Bitcoin white paper came out in 2008, it introduced a model of blockchains that kind of stuck around for the next decade, which is this monolithic model of blockchains, this monolithic era. This model where a blockchain couples consensus and execution. A model where every user has to execute every transaction of every other user, which we all know doesn't scale. A model that limits flexibility because you're enshrining specific execution environment and you can't experiment with different execution environments. But in 2019, I proposed Lazy Ledger, which is like a very simple blockchain that only does consensus and data availability. And in that model, um, you have a very roll-up centric model, model where you have a data and consensus layer that is only responsible for consensus and then an execution layer, which could be a roll-up that posts its blocks to a data layer and inherits consensus and security from the, from the data layer. And this basically ended up in a, mod in a modular blockchain ecosystem where consensus and co execution are no longer coupled. So what are the layers in a modular stack? Let's, let's quickly, let's very briefly go through them to recap. So the first layer is consensus. That's the layer at the bottom. And with consensus, provides an ordering over arbitrary messages. So developers input messages or transactions into the system, and the consensus layer simply decides what the order of those messages are. And then once those messages have been ordered, users need a way to verify that they've actually been published to the network. Because what could happen, a validator could execute a block or data withholding attack where they only publish the metadata of the block header, but they don't publish the actual data. And in that model, in that, with that attack, um, people, no one will know what the actual ordered messages are, and then no one will know what the state of the chain is and be able to generate fraud proofs or progress the chain. And interestingly, if you actually go back to the original Bitcoin white paper, the solution, the proposed solution to the double spend problem was this idea of a timestamping server. And I'll just read that here, out here, which is a timestamp server works by taking a hash of block of items to be timestamped, widely publishing the hash, such as in the newspaper or Usenet post. The timestamp proves that the data existed at a certain time, obviously in order to get, to, to get into the hash. And this is basically describing what the core property or what the core thing that a blockchain provides are, which is ordered data that is made available and timestamped. And if you have this basic primitive, which is a timestamping server, which is basically a consensus and data layer, then you can pretty much build anything on top of it using any kind of execution environment. And because we, if you understand that data availability consensus are basically the core primitives of blockchain, we figured out scalable ways to kind of scale that using a primitive called data availability sampling. And with data availability sampling, you have an over 99% guarantee that almost all the data is available by only downloading a very small portion of the data. And with this primitive, that basically means that we don't have to live in the world anymore where users have to download every other user's transaction. And so now you can scale blockchains more directly and, more, and um, in a more practical way. And then finally, or 
well, not finally, there's something after this, but you have the execution layer, and the execution layer sits above the data and consensus layers. And what the execution layer does is it, you know, takes a bunch, it takes a bunch of transactions, and it outputs a state. So, for example, those transactions, you know, could be payments, and the state is what, what people's account balance is. And that's what a rollup does, for example, or layer two does. It provides an execution environment to process transactions and to create a state commitment to what people's balances are. And in the modular, in the modular blockchain model, the consensus and execution layers are decoupled, as I mentioned. And then finally, you have the settlement layer. And a settlement layer is basically just like a special case of an execution layer that is used to bridge other execution layers or roll up together. So for example, if you, look, if you look at Ethereum as an execution layer, you have on-chain light, light nodes for roll ups on Ethereum, which act as bridges for, um, between roll up and Ethereum. You can bridge assets between them, and they can verify. And the, the on-chain light client accepts block headers from the roll up and verifies fraud proofs or ZK proofs. So putting that, putting that all together, like, what is a modular blockchain? There's something wrong with the slides? Well, what is a modular blockchain? Uh, a modular blockchain is basically a blockchain that fully outsources at least one of the four components of a blockchain. Um, but as I mentioned, that's either consensus, data availability, settlement, or execution. Okay, there we go. So, what are the benefits of modularity? The first one is obviously scalability. So, for several reasons, I'll just go to like two, two reasons here. The first reason is that, as I mentioned, you know, users don't have to execute the transaction of every other user, because now rollups, because they have the, they have their own execution environment. That means they have their own dedicated computation resources. Like if you spin up a rollup, you ha the rollup has its own computational resources. So even if another rollup gets busy or has high computational requirements, that's not going to affect every other rollup in the system. And secondly, thanks to data availability sampling, um, you have this loop where the more light nodes you have, the more block space you can have in a secure way, because the more light clients you have that are sampling. The, bit, the more um, data they can collectively reconstruct, and the bigger the block size that you can have. Because in a, in a system that does data availability sampling, the light nodes are collectively storing and making, the data, making all the data available instead of just like one or a few nodes. Secondly, you have the f developers get the freedom of choice. So, you know, like with Ethereum, um, instead of being limited with the Ethereum virtual machine, for example, over the past few years, there's been a lot of new developments and advancements in more efficient and more, more practical execution environments for different use cases, whether that's for scale or for privacy. You know, there's execution environments that add certain ZK uh, opcodes. And um, it's not really practical to deploy a new layer one just to make a modification to an execution environment. And so with, mod with a modular blockchain stack, you can now just modify EVM a little bit, you know, add an opcode, and just deploy a rollup for that instead of having to deploy a new um, layer one from scratch. And this is, this is also what um, various projects in our ecosystem have done as well. And you also have different types of rollups that you can use according to your use case, you know, like sovereign rollups, settled rollups, validiums, and celestiums. And Specifically, with sovereign rollups are an interesting case of rollups that have kind of gained traction over the past year that effectively give the community of that rollup the freedom to fork that rollup. So you basically get the freedom of a layer one, but without the overhead of a layer one, without needing to create a new consensus network or token necessarily from scratch. So let's talk about what the modular stack looks like today. And because we've made a lot of progress over the past you know, 12 months. This is what the modular stack looked like a year ago in 2022. Um, you know, a year ago, it was you know, mostly theoretical. You know, there's, there was various projects in the stack, 
but it was still very under, underdeveloped ecosystem. You know, like Ethereum was the only settlement layer, you know, very, very few execution layers, not a lot of infrastructure around it. But we've made a lot of progress in the past year, and this is what the modular, eco modular ecosystem looks like today. We have various new data availability, consensus, settlement, and execution environments. But more inter also interestingly, we have a lot of new infrastructure that sur is surrounding that modular stack. You know, we have um, infrastructure like block explorers, you know, and analytics providers, and so on and so forth. We also have uh, a surge in interest in sequencing providers, shared sequencer provider, sh shared sequencing, and decentralized sequencing um, that rollups can use. That makes rollups more censorship resistant, um, or more uh, have have better self commitment finality. And then you have various rollup frameworks, which make it. You know, very easy for developers to deploy their own new rollup without having to define to to write their own rollup from scratch. Um, you know, stacks like Opstack, Sovereign Labs, uh, Sovereign SDK, Rollkit. And you know, those stacks make it very easy for people to just you know write their application and deploy a rollup. And then we also have rollup as a service providers um, that use these rollup frameworks. And provide a hosted service for people to deploy their rollups. So instead of having to maintain your own infrastructure, just like you can go to AWS or DigitalOcean today, you can deploy a virtual machine in the cloud in seconds. In the future, you'll be able to deploy a rollup in seconds, you know, with a hosted provider, with whatever with with your code. And the goal here, the ultimate goal here, should from an engineering perspective, should be that deploying a rollup. Deploying your decentralized application as a rollup should be more easier and more convenient and more practical than deploying a new smart contract. And that's what that's basically what we've seen in, in Web 2. Like in Web 2, if you create a new web, web application or you deploy a new website, you don't go, you don't use WordPress usually, or you you don't use like a host provider. You deploy a new virtual machine in the cloud. You create you have your own virtual machine. So, in the and because that gives you more flexibility, more scale, more and more choice. You don't use existing. You don't use a shared hosting provider or a shared platform necessarily. In many cases, um, you know, like a WordPress or, or, or a Blogspot. And then finally, we have a various number of new cross-chain providers, um, and MEV, providing bridging across rollups, but across different frameworks. But the goal of this conference today is to get everyone to make connections and to talk and to discuss um, the future of the modular eco ecosystem. And then, so who knows what's in store for 2024 and what new layers in this, or what new t types of tooling and infrastructure that we might have not even thought about today might exist in 2024. You know, like, like, a, like a year ago, people weren't really talking about shared sequencers. Now, they're all the rage. A uh, quick few highlights um, over the past year. Uh, in the past few months, um, in, I mean, a few months ago, Opstack was the first, you know, uh, kind of uh, Ethereum-focused roll-up framework to add a modular data availability API, and we, con um, we at Celestia contributed that data availability API, and that made it possible to use to uh, create to deploy Opstack chains using Celestia. As a DA layer and other DA layers as well, and to me this is like really the meaning of modularism and not maximalism because this is like an example of different ecosystems working together and interoperating with each other in a beneficial way. We also have Manta, which is which is deploying an OpStack rollup based on this um, interface, and then Caldera has also launched a testnet um, using this OpStack interface. Um, we have like a year ago. Um, about a year ago, I, I, we introduced the concept of sovereign rollups, which are still controversial in certain communities. But um, the idea of a sovereign rollup is, you know, you have it like uh, rollups don't necessarily have to be a scaling mechanism for L1. They can also just be a new, an interesting, um, and more efficient way to deploy a new blockchain or sovereign chain. Like instead of deploying a Cosmos chain, you can just deploy a Cosmos rollup, and. A year ago, sovereign rollups didn't exist. Like there was no implementation of a sovereign rollup. 
But now we have many projects actually building and working on Sovereign rollups, um, which is really cool to see. You know, we have Sovereign Labs um, building Sovereign SDK. They recently launched an alpha release of the Sovereign SDK, which is a toolkit that lets you deploy and create Sovereign SDK rollups. Um, we have Eclipse, which is a rollup as a service provider for Sovereign rollups. And we also have Rollkit, which recently was able to deploy the first Sovereign rollup on Bitcoin, which is really cool because you know Bitcoin has historically been one of the most maximalist communities. And this is really kind of like a, when, we, when that was published, that was kind of like seen as a way to kind of foster a cross, um, cross chain collaboration. We also had uh, Dimension releasing the first IBC enabled rollup using the EVM, which is really cool to see as well. Um, and they also have a testnet live as well. But there's many more highlights, which I, I can't list all in this talk. We have a very, uh, Celestia has a rapidly expanding ecosystem. We also have here, um, various applications, including gaming providers, gaming chains. After this talk, I know that Scott is talking from Argus about the world's engine. Curio did an interesting demo recently where they run a real-time strategy game on a modified EVM rollup on Celestia. And there's many other as well, many other interesting pieces of infrastructure and applications on the stack. So we have made a lot of progress over the past year, and we're reaching an inflection point. But there's, there's, there's still like a lot of open problems that we need to solve to get to where we need to get where we need to go, and to really make to really defeat maximalism, and to have a you know positive sum mindset instead of a zero sum mindset. And this conference is um, is meant to kind of like foster these conversations and try to you know, discuss these open problems and progress the stack. So one of the open problems is, you know, you, you use a UX for bridging. Um, there's still a lot of work to improve UX and bridging, especially in the Cosmos ecosystem. Like users need multiple fee tokens, for example, to bridge across chains. I know there's various people also working on that, like Skip. I think they recently did a demo recently. Um, you can go on ibc.fun. It's like a, it's a website that, that has a demo. Um, we also need like, t tooling for custody um, and payment systems for rollups and to access resources across the, the stack. So, for example, you might have a rollup that uses that 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 needs to pay the DA layer or settlement layer, and there needs to be a way to kind of hold these different tokens or do exchange or do um, kind of like token exchanges in a easy way for developers without them having to maintain too much like wallet infrastructure and you know pricing mechanisms and so on and so forth. There's also a lot, um, it's kind of like a good problem in a way, but there's a lot of choice for developers. Um, and that can be very hard for the developers to understand the trade-offs between those like different execution environments, different settlement layers, different DA layers. And so I think we need like do a better job at trying to kind of like ex educate developers or explain the trade-offs between different, between different uh, components in the stack. We also have a lot of dependencies across the stack. Um, you know, like a DA layer has to connect to an, to an execution environment and, and you know, so on and so forth. And there isn't really any common interfaces. You know, like for example, OpStack has a specific DA interface. Um, different, the, you know, Rollkit has a specific DA interface. Um, you know, Tendermint has a ABCI uh, interface that interacts with Cosmos. And these dependencies can be very hard to maintain if there's a breaking change in any of these dependencies. So I think we should have some discussion around if there's a way to create some common interfaces or to have better dependency management across the stack so things are less likely to break when improvements are made. We need better proving systems or more work on proving systems. So like fraud proving systems are still underdeveloped because you know, like there, there isn't a single permissionless deployment of a fraud proof rollup, except for field v1, obviously. And then ZK proving systems are still slow. There's still a lot of, kind of optimizations that need to be made, they need to be made faster. I know there's a lot of work in hardware acceleration and um, FPGAs to, 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 to make ZK proving systems faster. And also privacy. Um, like one of the reasons why 
the current blockchain does not have privacy is because you often need to enshrine it in the, into the execution environment. But now we have the opportunity to do, to do that because instead of having to deploy a new layer one just to deploy a new execution environment, people can now, people can now experiment with previously enabled execution environments. And I know that Anoma is going to be talking about some of these topics um, later today and tomorrow. So, like, what is what 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 we're trying to achieve? Like, what is the destination we're trying to get to? So, so what? Like, let's discuss like some of the values of modularism and what we're trying to ach get, achieve with the module blockchain stack. So, first of all, users should be first-class citizens of the network. This is like an ideal in crypto and Web three that seems to have been seems to have been forgotten over the past ten years. Like the whole point of blockchains and the whole point of Bitcoin is that you don't have to trust middlemen, you know. Like, you don't, and that includes validators and miners. You shouldn't have to trust middlemen or, or and centralized RPC endpoints and APIs, because that's just Web two all over again. If the main way that users are interacting with Web two is just through centralized APIs, that's not like fundamentally different to Web two. You're just interacting with a database. So like one of the things I appreciate about Bitcoin is that it has very good light node support, light client support. You can actually install a light client on your phone and that connects directly to the, to the Bitcoin network and can get data out of the Bitcoin network um, and without using any centralized API endpoints. So I think we kind of like need to go back to this ideal. Um, and that's, what, that's why data availability sampling light clients are important to allow users to get back to the roots of Web3 and to really make, allow users to not have to rely on centralized middlemen and endpoints, which, could be, which, are, which are prone to censorship and corruption. Secondly, um, uh, like modularism and non-maximalism is one of the obvious important ideals of modularism. And this is pretty much what this whole conference is about. And the reason why this is so important is because over the past decade, we've been stuck in this endless cycle of new layer one chains every single bull run. You know, like you had Ethereum in 2014, then in 2017 you had EOS, you know, Tron, Cardano, and they promised the world. And then um, 2021 we had uh, Solana and Avalanche. And then this time now we have Aptos and Sui. But that is, this, is, this is not sustainable because this is just creating, uh, it was just creating an endless cycle of new tribes and new ecosystems that are not collaborating with each other. You can't have a, it's a very zero sum mindset and that needs to be replaced with a positive sum mindset where incremental improvements can, can impact everyone that, that uses crypto. And we can replace the zero sum mindset with a positive sum mindset by adopting a modular ecosystem or a modular stack where people can, you know, for example, there's the, if people make a more efficient execution environment like Aptos and Sui have, or Solana have, you can just deploy, you can just replace that layer in the stack, you can, re you can replace the execution environment in the stack without having to deploy a new layer one. Because it's, it's, it's simply not sustainable to have a constant graveyard of new layer ones that are sucking up a lot of funding, but eventually like fa extract value, they fail to get traction. And like crypto is never gonna mature with this, uh, with this cycle. And it's really important that we escape this endless cycle as soon as possible to have a more positive sum crypto ecosystem that actually kind of develop, uh, develops into worldwide uh, mainstream developer ad adoption. And finally, um, one of the important aspects is of, of modularism is that communities have the choice to be sovereign if they want to. They don't have to, but like, if they want to, they can. And sovereignty is basically the freedom to fork. Because like one of the fundamental things that block, uh, crypto and blockchains allow that previous systems haven't allowed is the ability for a group of people to, with a specific shared goal to kind of thrive through self-organization and collective action by effectively having a, creating a contract with each other that for the first time does, it does not need to be enforced by you know phys like um, physical law or like you know police or courts, but can be enforced cryptographically on the peer-to-peer -peer network. 
Um, whereas previously, you had to, if you wanted to create a shared agreement, you would have to do so under like a specific jurisdiction. But with blockchains, you can kind of bypass all of that and have a direct top-level social contract. And a top-level social contract gives people gives you the freedom to fork if the community decides that they want to change the protocol rules. So to recap, the, the three values of blockchain modularism: users should be first, the, should, users should be first-class citizens of the network um, by focusing on light nodes and allowing people to run light nodes. Secondly, modularism and not maximalism. So we need to escape the. It's really important that we escape the layer one. You know, blockchain um, monolithic loop. Otherwise, crypto will never grow up. And finally, communities can choose to be sovereign because they have the right to fork if they want to. So, I really hope that you enjoy the conference and um, a lot of interesting conversations happen. I'll be around, and um, many of the Celestia team and other teams on the ecosystem will be, will be around. Thank you.